All right, friends, welcome back to a new week. We're going to continue with induction and recursion, uh, maybe even getting into recursion this time. And I have some fun examples for you. They are quite difficult uh, examples of induction. And so I would never hope to ask you this on some kind of test, but they're really good so you can see the uh, inner workings of how induction works. So remember that induction is just two things, a base case, a place to start, and then a way to get from where you were to somewhere new that you can chain together forever and ever and ever and have a predicate be true for all the natural numbers. It's the greatest thing in the world. It's a very powerful thing. And so I have a fun example for you now. Here we go. So uh, it's a nice classic example that a lot of people like to give, but I personalized it. You're welcome. Uh, let us pretend that Fresno State, they are experimenting with the world's coolest corn crop, okay? It grows in an L shape. So you take three squares and you put them together like this. You can rotate it however you want, but it's kind of like an L, okay? That's the way that the corn grows. We get no say in that. Uh, and they would like to use a 2n by 2n grid of squares to grow their corn, okay? That is how big of a plot of land they have. Uh, they can make it as big as they want, but it has to be perfectly powers of 2 on each side, okay? It's got to be a 2n by 2n plot of squares to grow that corn. And their final requirement is that in the middle, there is like a bunch of corners, right? In one of the middles, they would like to put a sprinkler, okay? They would like to put a sprinkler so they can, of course, water all that corn. That's the idea. So we like to know, can you always do this? Can you always make, uh, can you always tile a 2n by 2n grid with our L-shaped corn while leaving somewhere in the middle, one of those corners of the middle, leaving out a spot for a sprinkler, okay? So this is our proof. This is our theorem we would like to prove for all n, for all natural numbers n, there is a way to tile a 2n by 2n plot with that cool L-shaped corn while leaving out a square in the center, a 1 by 1 square in the center. So it could be 2 by 2, it could be 8 by 8, but it's a power of 2, and uh, we can use induction to prove this, okay? So uh, round one, let's try and prove it with this theorem statement. Something will go wrong, okay? So let us pretend that this is what we want, uh, and this is our p of n right here. Everything from here to here, that's our p of n. And we want to prove it using induction. So base case, we need to prove that p of 0 is true, OK? n equals 0. Let's prove that p of 0 is true. So let's prove that there's a way to tile a 2n by 2n, 2 to the 0 by 2 to the 0 plot, with L-shaped corn with a square left out in the center. Well, this is just 1 by 1. Can't put any corn. Just put the sprinkler. That works. See that? We've tiled it correctly. We've left out a square in the middle. It's the one square. Done. QED for the first part, for the base case. And now we have the inductive step. So using previous knowledge, can we get to the next thing? So we need to prove that for all n, p of k implies p of k plus 1, or for all k, p of k implies p of k plus 1. So this is what we get to assume, and this is what we get to, to prove, OK? To assume to show. So we get to assume we can tile a 2 to the k by 2 to the k plot. We just need to use this knowledge somehow to tile. We need to tile p to the k plus 1, a 2 to the k plus 1 plot. OK, using this knowledge somehow. So here is the secret. If you have a 2 to the k by 2 to the k plot, that's all nice and filled in with your little L-shaped tiles, etc., uh, you can put four of these back to back. That's the secret. That's how you can use your inductive hypothesis. You can do this. Here is four separate 2 to the k by 2 to the k plots. and you know what happens when you put 2 to the k on both sides. These become 2 to the k plus 1 by 2 to the k plus 1 on each side. Isn't that nice? So the inductive hypothesis tells us that we can find a way to tile all these separately, 
all these four things separately, and then we gotta bring them together and somehow put a sprinkler right here, okay? Or right here, it doesn't really matter. And the problem is this is never gonna work because the inductive hypothesis told us that we can put the sprinklers in the middle somewhere for each of these, okay? We can put the sprinklers in the middle somewhere for each of these, so that we got four sprinklers if we wanted. This says nothing about putting a sprinkler like right here. It doesn't work, okay? We can't somehow magically move the sprinklers down here to the corner. It doesn't work like that. So, sad face. Uh-oh, something went wrong. We did not have enough power in our P to the K to prove the next thing, okay? So we say that our induction hypothesis or our inductive hypothesis wasn't strong enough. We have to make it stronger. We have to strengthen it. So uh, it just so happens, and don't worry, I would have never figured this out on my own either. It just so happens that you can do this. You can make a, a different theorem to prove a new thing. You can say, for all n and n, there is a way to tile a 2n by 2n plot with L-shaped plants while leaving out a 1 by 1 square wherever you want. You can leave out the square on the side, uh, two from the middle if you wanted to. If you can leave the square out wherever you want, we can actually make this work. This, this stronger proof will actually go through, it's funny. Uh, and if you can just prove this, the stronger thing, obviously you can put the thing in the middle, that's totally fine. You have all the say in this, okay? So, let's prove it. Base case, same as before. Same as before, QED. It's again just a one, one by one little plot with a sprinkler in the middle. Now the inductive step is interesting. Inductive, in, inductive step, please. Inductive step. We assume P to the K, and then we prove P to the K plus one. which means we can fill in a two by two to the k by two to the k plot. However we want, we can leave a square out wherever we want, okay? We need to prove, need to show p to, p to the k plus one, which means we can tile a two to the k plus one by two to the k plus one plot. And this way is gonna work. And let me show you the proof. Boop, boop. Boop. And remember, we have to pick for this bigger plot. We we can pick anywhere to leave out this thing. And without loss of generality, let's pretend that we're leaving out the square in the upper left, okay? Square in the upper left. And the reason this is not going to matter without loss of generality works This is like a subplot. Uh, the reason that this doesn't matter is because you can just rotate these things, right? Nobody really cares if it was like that or like something else. Sorry. See, now it's there, now it's there, now it's there. It doesn't really matter, the shape. Uh, but we gotta leave a square out of one of these four. Let's pretend it was the first one. Then, we know, by the inductive hypothesis, how to fill in the rest of these with one square left out. But the problem is, we want to fill in this whole thing with just this square left out, okay? That's the one we picked. Here's the secret. For these, leave out these squares. For each of these three, leave out these squares on the corners, okay? So, for the other three, leave out the inner corners. Because look what you can do now. If you did that, and you, and you can by the inductive hypothesis, it tells you you can leave out a square wherever you want in these subplots. Then you just fill in this little, one, one more corn plant. Isn't that fun? And then, we can leave out this square just as easily. Uh, we can do this. by the IH, the inductive hypothesis. It tells us that we can leave out a square in this subplot because that's what we're assuming. That's part of P to the K. For any two to the K by two to the K plot, we can leave out a square wherever we want. And this is where we wanted to leave it out in the bigger picture, okay? 
And then the rest of these, we put, in, we put them in that special spot so we can add a corn plant. And now suddenly we've proved the inductive step. For any 2 to the k plus 1 by 2 to the k plus 1 plot, we can leave out a square wherever we'd like. Just remembering to leave the corners like that for the others. And then that means we've proven the whole thing. That's the original thing that we wanted. We can leave out a square in the center if we wanted to because we have complete control now. Isn't that fun? So it just so happens that no matter the size of your plot, you can always put a sprinkler, not just in the middle, but wherever you want. That's the beauty of uh, induction, okay? That's a fun little graphical proof. Uh, please yell at me if it's not making sense, uh, but it is now your turn, okay? So let's prove by induction that this summation, left-hand side equals this right-hand side uh, for everybody, okay? So give that a try. All right, so uh, again, this is like P of N, this whole thing. This is P of N, yeah? That whole thing is P of N. So we're gonna prove this by induction, so we need a base case. So we need to find the smallest thing such that this is all true. And I think because J starts at one, let's just let N equal one, because that'll just be a very simple summation, okay? Base case can be N equal one, because that's the, that's the first value of n for which this summation ma makes any sense at all, right? n equals 1, so then we need to show that j equals 1 to 1 of j times 2 to the j is equal to 1 minus 1 times 2 to the n, not n, but uh, 2 to the 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 2. <laughs> okay, that's what we need to show. Uh, okay, well, this side is, well, sit j is 1, it's only ever going to be 1, so it's 1 times 2 to the 1, that's equal to 0, this whole thing goes to 0, plus 2, equals 2. So 2 equals 2, yeah, that makes sense, that's going to work. Inductive step. Assume it works for p of k, prove that it works for p of k plus 1, okay? So assume, we get to assume that this is true for k, okay? assume the the inductive hypothesis gives us that this is true that j equals 1 to k of j times 2 to the j is equal to k minus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2 and then we need to show uh, something based on this let me uh, just bring all this into a new slide bam up you go. So we need to show now that it works for k plus 1 using this knowledge. Okay, to show j equals 1 to k plus 1 of j times 2 to the j equals k plus 1 minus 1, I think, right? That was how it was supposed to be. k plus 1 minus, yeah, times 2 to the k plus one plus one plus two yeah I think that was it so uh, we need to show this side is equal to this side let's work on this side first I'll use a different color this side you can bring out the k plus one term in the summation that's very helpful a lot of the time so just make it go from one to k and then we'll bring out the k plus one term it's okay k plus one times two to the k plus one Okay, so this is all the same still. We just brought out this k plus 1 term when j is equal to k plus 1. All right, this we can rewrite because of the inductive hypothesis. We know that this is equal to that. So this becomes, okay, k minus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2, and then we still have this, plus k plus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1. All right, so we have like terms. Bring them together. That's equal to how many 2 to the k plus 1s? Well, k minus 1 and k plus 1. So that's 2k. 2k times 2k plus 1 plus 2. Yeah? Okay. Now we have to prove that it's the same as this, which is true, because this is k. That is uh, 2 to the k plus 2, right? So we just need to prove that. So we can bring that 2 up into there. 
This is k times 2 to the k plus 2 plus 2. k times 2 to the k plus 2 plus 2. We did it. We showed that they are equal, so the summation always works. No matter this, we found a closed form of it. That's the standard way of finding those closed forms. Okay? Hopefully it's making more sense the more examples we do. That's, that's just the only secret to learning induction. You've got to do a ton of little examples. All right, so let's try this one now. For any positive integer n, so your base case better start at 1, 7 evenly divides 9n minus 2n. Okay, give that a shot. Okay, so base case, n equal 1. And then we'll use that to prove everybody else. Start somewhere. Base case n equals 1. We better show that 7 divides 9 to the 1 minus 2 to the 1 equals 7, which, yeah, that, that totally makes sense because 7 equals 7 times 1. That works. Okay, so 7 totally divides itself. That's the base case. Now we use the inductive step. So we assume that it works for k, prove that it works for k plus 1. So assume... 7 divides 9 to the k minus 2 to the k. And let's break this down. We're going to have to eventually. So using the definition, we know that uh, 9 to the k minus 2 to the k uh, sorry, equals 7 times some number. I don't know. Uh, can't use k. Let's use j or something for some integer j. That's what it means for 7 to divide that. We, ne we now need to prove to show that 7 evenly divides 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 to the k plus 1, somehow using this. Okay, oops. And so uh, the secret is, well, we can take a 9 out of this and a 2 out of this, and then we'll have to the power of k. Okay, so uh, likewise, instead of this, we can show that 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 to the k plus 1 is equal to 7 times some integer. Can't use k, can't use j, let's just say m or something. Okay, so let's just show this. So let's break it down. We have 9 to the 9 times 9 to the k minus 2 times 2 to the k. We need to prove that that's equal to 7 times something. Okay, and then we would have proven that it divides evenly into 7. Uh, okay. So here's the secret. This can be simplified by solving this for 9 to the k, OK? From here, we can get 9 to the k equals 2k plus 7 times j. Isn't that funny? So this is just equal to 9 times, using the inductive hypothesis, ho ho, 9 times this. That's what 9 to the k is, apparently. 2 to the k plus 7 times j and then we have minus 2 times 2 to the k. Oh man, does this distribute. This is wonderful. This is 9 times 2 to the k plus 9 times 7 times j minus 2 times 2 to the k. Bring the 2 to the k's together. Oh man, how many 2 to the k's do we have? 9 minus 2 of them. That's 7 times 2 to the k. And uh, then we have, uh, let's see here plus, where was I going with this, plus 9 times 7 times j. Okay, and this is wonderful because, what do you know, this whole thing, dun dun dun, this whole thing becomes divisible by 7 because we can take a 7 out of this, equals 7 times 2 to the k plus uh, 9j, okay? So that's your m. That's what m could be. Let m be this. Let's write over here. Let m be that thing right there, and then we've proved it, okay? Hopefully that made sense. We're just using our inductive hypothesis, this thing that we get to assume. It better help us eventually. That's the whole point of using induction. Okay, that thing needs to help us. Okay, so I uh, guess I didn't need that one. Nice. That brings us to something called strong induction, right? So uh, like the name implies, it's 
a part of induction, it's a way of doing induction, where the inductive step, it has a bit more power, it's stronger. So the base case is the same, you still prove it for some small number, and then the inductive step is not just using p of k to prove p of k plus 1, but everybody before you, all the way down to the base case. Everybody gets to work together to prove k plus 1. p of 0, p of 1, you get to use all of them, all the way to p of k, to prove p of k plus 1. They get to work together. Okay, you get to use every previous factor instead of just the most recent one, which a lot of the time is useful. And it's really funny because strong induction is really no more powerful than regular induction. It's just a different way of framing things. Uh, you can prove that strong induction is valid using normal induction. You can just use a, a carefully crafted predicate. It's funny to think about. So uh, let me give you some examples of this. Okay, so uh, first theorem. Every positive integer n greater than 1 can be written as a product of primes. Okay, so uh, let's do this. Every positive integer n greater than 1 can be written as a, po as a product of primes. So base case, what's the smallest one that this works for? Uh, well, n equals 2, I think, right? n equals 2. Let's prove that 2 is a product of primes. So well, 2 is already a product of primes because it is a prime. 2 is prime. So it's already a product of primes. Okay, it's already a product of primes. So we're good. Check QED. Inductive step. And I'm going to show you just why we need everybody else, not just k, to prove k plus 1. So assume that we know this is true. Assume 2 through k can be written as product of primes, can be written. I'm having some trouble writing. Can be written as prods of primes. Okay, that's our inductive hypothesis. Uh, we get to prove that we get to assume that all of these numbers can be written as products of primes, which is very helpful because we need to show need to show that k plus one can be written as a product of primes. as a prod of primes. Okay, are you ready? So, uh, the secret is there's two cases. Case 1 and case 2. Case 1 is where k plus 1 is prime. It has no factors. Okay, k plus 1 is prime, which means k plus 1 by itself is a product of primes. Okay, so that, that's fine for that case. Uh, case 2 is the one where we need strong induction because k plus 1 is factorable. It equals, k plus 1 equals like i times j or something for two integers, i and j. And we have no control over what these are. Like, uh, it depends on the number, right? And because it's integers, though, we know it's never, like, k plus 1, it never happens that it's equal to k times some other integer. That doesn't make, that doesn't actually work for integer land, only for fractions. So, these are numbers, and they're definitely not k minus 1, or sorry, they're definitely not k. So, this is where we can use our inductive hypothesis, because whatever i and j are, they're between 2 and k, right? That's what it means to be factorable. They're definitely not 1, they're between 2 and k. So we can use the inductive hypothesis to write both of these as products of, pr products of primes. i and j can be written by the inductive hypothesis, so by the ih. i and j can be written as products of primes. And that means, therefore, k plus 1, which equals i times j, can be written by, well, you can just replace this by a product of primes, product of primes. You're multiplying a product of primes by another product of primes, which is still, what do you know, a product of primes. So, uh, is a prod of primes. Yay, QED. Okay. So we needed strong induction because none of these, none of i and j, none of the factors of this were k. It didn't work that way. Okay. 
So that's why we needed everybody. And they all needed to help us because we have no control over numbers and how they factor. Okay? Could be anything. And here's a fun one. Strong induction. Uh, for all integers n greater than or equal to 11, Fibonacci of n, the Fibonacci function, like the, the nth Fibonacci number, is greater than or equal to 1.5n. So it's bounded below by 1.5n. So if you ever have a function that runs in Fibonacci of n time, it's, it's actually exponential. <laughs> okay? That's funny. So yeah, this grows exponentially. It actually grows the Fibonacci function. It approaches the golden ratio, phi, phi to the n, uh, but that is beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, so let's just prove this. For all integers n greater than or equal to 11, this is true. So base case, so n equals 11. So that's where we have to start. We can go bigger than 11, but we can't be smaller. We have to start there. So let's prove that Fibonacci of n, fib of 11, well, it better be greater than or equal to 1.5 times 11. And I have taken the liberty of doing all this beforehand. Uh, Fibonacci of 11, I've defined the Fibonacci function in racket. Fibonacci of 11 is uh, 89, and the other one's 86.5. Bam. So that works. That checks out. That's cool. Uh, inductive step, though, is where it gets interesting. You assume it works uh, for everybody smaller than you from so works assume I guess assume p of 11 through p of k okay we get all of those we have every single one of them da 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 up to p of k we need to need to prove need to show that p of k plus one is true which is that Fibonacci of k plus 1 is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k plus 1. Okay? So now we can break it down using the definition. Fibonacci of k plus 1, well, how do you define the Fibonacci sequence for larger numbers? Well, it's just the sum of one term ago plus two terms ago. So that's uh, Fib of k plus 1 minus 1 so k plus fib of k plus 1 minus 2, or k minus 1. Okay, that's what it's equal to. And now, by the inductive hypothesis, we know that all this is true for these smaller guys. We need strong induction because we use more than just p of k. So, by, by the IH, by the inductive hypothesis, we get for fib of k and fib of k minus 1, we get that fib of k is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k, and fib of k minus 1 is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k minus 1. And you can add together inequalities. So that is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k plus 1.5 to the k minus 1. And we can actually bring out a 1.5, right? So from this one, so that we can get it 1.5 to the k minus 1 twice. So that's equal to 1.5 to the k minus 1, sorry, times 1.5. I'll just put it over here, plus 1.5 to the k minus 1. So how many 1.5 to the k minus 1s are there? Well, there's 1 plus 1.5. So there are 2.5 times 1.5 to the k minus 1. I'm sorry, this is getting messy. So that's what this is equal to. And if only this were equal to 1.5 squared, because then you can bring that into here and it would be exactly 1.5 to the k plus 1, right? So what is 1.5 squared? Also did that. 1.5 squared is 2.25. Oh shoot, that's bigger. That's bigger than 1.5 squared times 1.5 to the k minus 1, which equals uh, 1.5 to the k plus 1. We did it. QED. Did you see how we did that? Did you see how it all fell together at the very end? We need to prove this, which was equal to this, which is greater than or equal to this, which simplifies to all this, which is greater than this, which is finally the thing that we wanted. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So yeah, we proved that it's greater than or equal to in all these cases. Fun stuff. All right. So, uh, 
I'm just throwing proof techniques at you today, I guess. Uh, there's one called the well ordering principle, and this one's actually pretty easy. It's used in a lot of uh, proofs by contradiction. Uh, this is kind of the way that you have to use it. The well ordering principle, it says that give me a non empty set of natural numbers. I don't know, 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. It could be infinite even. You can always find a smallest element in that set, okay? Which makes sense because the natural numbers, I mean, it's either. Uh, they only go down to zero. You got to find one of those. You'll find eventually the smallest one, right? Just walk through the whole set. So that's pretty obvious, but surprisingly, it's the same as induction. In power, in proof power, just this little fact, the simple fact, is equivalent to induction. It's crazy. And you can prove by contradiction that well ordering implies mathematical induction and vice versa. Uh, but sadly, we don't have time for this in the lecture. Oh well. You can read about it in your book, though. What I do want to show you is how to use the well-ordering principle, because it makes some proofs go through a bit easier, though you could have just used induction. OK, so let me show you this. So we're going to prove that any amount of postage worth 8 cents or more can be made from 3 cent or 5 cent stamps. All right, so uh, we have to make some kind of set, and we have to find some smallest element to do this proof. OK, that's the idea. And we're going to prove it by contradiction. OK. So, proof by contradiction. So, give me, we're going to, let's assume that it doesn't work for everybody, okay? It doesn't work for any amount of, uh, for some amount that's worth eight cents or more, okay? So, find all the, uh, we're going to assume that that's not true, right, for contradiction. So assume that the theorem is false, and then let's find all the places, all the cent values for which the theorem is false. For which the statement doesn't hold. So that's a set of numbers, a set of natural numbers. Find the smallest one now. Call the smallest one I don't know, some value A or something. That's the smallest cent value that didn't work. Okay, and we're proving by contradiction. So there's some smallest value that doesn't work. So let me show you that it can't be 8. It can't be 8 because uh, these are like your little base cases if you were doing induction. It doesn't work for 8 because you can use a 3 cent, 3 cent, and a 5 cent stamp to make 8. It doesn't work for 9 because you could use a uh, three, three cents stamps. It doesn't work for 10, uh, or it does work for 10, because you can use two five cent stamps. And so whatever number you're telling me didn't work and was the smallest one it didn't work for, it wasn't eight, nine, or 10, it was bigger, okay? And that's key. So uh, A must be greater than 10. We know that now, based on this scratch work. Now, here's the idea. But a minus 3 did work. Because you gave me the smallest thing that didn't work. I know that a minus 3 does work, and it's greater than 8. Greater than or equal to 8. Just add to whatever worked for a minus 3 another 3 cent stamp. Just add another three cent stamp. QED. And it really did work. So the idea, we called upon the well ordering principle by finding the smallest element in this set. And then we gave, uh, we found a contradiction based on that element. We, we proved that it didn't actually exist. Okay? Because that element really worked for this theorem. We could make postage using five and three cent stamps. And the trick is, uh, because five and three are relatively prime to an, one another, it always is going to work, okay? If you were wondering why that actually works, uh, it's because they are relatively prime. Uh, so that's fun. That's a cute little example. And now here's a, a cool, like well, like giant fun example. We can finally prove the division algorithm. Remember I was talking about that? Wasn't sure if we'd prove it. Well, we're going to prove it. And uh, it's so simple. It seems to be so simple, but it's hard to like formulate. 
uh, but we have the tools now using while ordering to do it. So uh, the division algorithm means that if you want to divide n by some number d, uh, you can find a quotient and a remainder, and the remainder is within this range. Okay, that's just what it means to divide something by something else. So let's like pretend we're dividing seven by two. Uh, that's equal to. Uh, no, sorry, seven equals two times three plus one. That's the remainder, and that's the. Uh, no, sorry, that's the quotient. So the trick is we have to make some set. So make the set like this. So make s, which is equal to, here's our number n that we're trying to divide by d. Well, subtract it by all the integers t times d, OK? Such that t is an integer, uh, so it's in z, actually. Uh, and n minus the whole thing, t times d, is greater than or equal to 0. So make this set. So for example, if we're making the set of all uh, for this and we're trying to divide 7 by 2, we'll make the set with 7, then 7 times, uh, that's 7 minus 0 times d, 0 times 2, 7 minus 1 times 2, so we have 5, 7 minus 2 times 2, 3, 2, 1, negative 1, negative 3, etc. in that direction. And then you can also get bigger up here, 9, going up in that direction by 2. So what we would like to do is cut off all the things that are negative. So we'll cut off everybody down here. And oh man, do we have a set of natural numbers. So we can find the smallest one. OK, so find the smallest element in S. Call it r, because that's what it is. This is the remainder of dividing 7 by 1, or 7 by 2. Isn't that crazy? Call it r. And so r, by definition, it's greater than or equal to 0. Let's also show that it's less than d. So r is less than d because just uh, a, you can prove this by contradiction. So here's like a tiny little contradiction proof inside of the bigger proof. Uh, r is strictly smaller than d because if r is greater than d, that means there was a smaller element. There could have been a smaller element. Because like, if you're telling me that, oh, sorry, it's not 3, 2, 1. It's just 3, 1. If you're telling me that 3 is the smallest element in this set, uh, you're lying because it's greater than d. And you can always subtract 2 still and get it still a positive or at least a non-negative number. OK, so that's, that's my reasoning there. It's a small little proof by contradiction. Because if, if r was bigger than d, you could divide by one more thing. And it would still, uh, you, w you still wouldn't have passed 0. OK, so r checks out. And then call the, uh, the t for this case. for this r, call it q. OK, that's the idea. So now we have we have this. We have n equals, oh, sorry. We have n minus t, which I'm calling q now. q times d, that's equal to this thing I'm calling r. And r is within the proper range. q is an integer. And I can just solve for n. n equals q times d plus r. Isn't that silly? Uh, or not silly, isn't that cool? Uh, that is how the division algorithm works. It just, it just goes, it just makes sense. And the trick was we needed to find the smallest element of a set. That's how we whittled it down to find this, uh, this remainder. That's how we knew we were at the remainder. So that was what we needed to prove the, to prove the division algorithm. Okay, something simple yet powerful. All right, let's see how much time we have left. Uh, I think I'd like to get to here. If I can, we'll try. Uh, let's talk about verifying that programs are correct. Uh, I know I gave you a, a little sneak peek of this at the very start of the semester, but you're ready for it now. So what you can do, you can prove programs are correct by 
showing that uh, if something called a precondition is true, so something that's true before something, so pre, if it's true before the program starts, then the program will end after a finite number of steps, and a post condition will be true. Okay, so something's true before, something's true after, and that is uh, that's what you want. Okay, so given this state of the world, the world will turn out in this way in my favor. Okay, so this also works for individual statements. So here's what I want to show you. Uh, we're going to compute the sum of x, y, and z in a silly way but it's for uh, demonstrative purposes, I promise. So this is this function, if we call it on x, y, and z, it's just going to give back x plus y plus z. That's what we want. Let me show this to you, okay? Let me show this to you using these things called preconditions and postconditions, all right? So between every line, we, there is a precondition and there's a postcondition, a thing that's true before and a thing that's true afterward, okay? So these can be called assertions as well. So before anything happens, the precondition that's true is x, y, and z, they're just numbers. Don't know what they are. We're going to compute the sum of them, okay? And now, here's where the fun things happen. These are just a bunch of assignment statements, but they're going to get us towards the right answer, all right? So what's true after this statement, okay? Still x, y, z are numbers, and sum is zero, okay? Sum is equal to zero, and still, and everything that's what was above x, y, and z are numbers still, so, okay? And then, using this as our precondition, if we know that this is true, what, what happens, what's the postcondition after we add x into sum? Sum equals x now, you see that? We can prove this. This is programming, this is math. I know it's a very simple thing, it's contrived, but this is what you can do for big full-blown programs, all right? And then, with this as your precondition, executing this line, obviously sum is equal to x plus y. And this is how you think in your mind when you're writing a program, right? This is essentially how you're proving to yourself that it's correct. And then if this is true before and we execute this line, what's true afterward? Well, sum better be equal to x plus y plus z. Oh man, and when we return sum, we know that this is true. That's the post condition. That's what we're given back. We're given back the right thing. Okay? That is program verification in a nutshell. So, uh, preconditions and po post conditions are very, uh, at least for straight line code, for assignments, they make sense. Yeah? Not too bad. Um, there are other things, other tools in our arsenal that we can use to prove programs correct, uh, and they are called invariants. So, Invariant is a Latin word. It means, in means not, right? And variant means like changing, okay? It means changing, varying, changing, altering itself. So an invariant is uh, something that doesn't change. It's a statement that is always true, no matter what happens inside your program, inside of your uh, predicate, doesn't matter at all, okay? So uh, an invariant is something that cannot change, okay? And it can be used in proofs. So for example, I'm going to label chessboards using like coordinates, like this is a coordinate system, and here's zero, zero, or like here is zero, zero, I guess. That's zero, zero. This is uh, one, zero, etc. So put a, put a bishop right here. We'll call it zero, zero on a chessboard. Can the bishop get here two, four, three? Ever? Like with some sequence of moves, can they ever get there? And the answer is no, because this bishop is on the black squares, okay? No, it can only move to other black squares. Okay, that's an invariant. That's something that's always true about the bishop's position. It doesn't matter where he is, the only place that he can get to is black squares. Okay, can never get to a white one. That is the key. All right, that is an invariant. And we could talk about invariants in our programs. So we can say that uh, when we have a loop, that's something that executes a number of times that we have no clue about, like the body of this loop. Maybe it executes five times, maybe it executes 50 times. It depends on the number that we're iterating with, right? Maybe it's user input even. A loop invariant is something that's very nice. It 
gives us something that's always true about our loop, no matter how many times the body is executed. So we can still prove something about it once it's all said and done. Okay, so uh, here's something that won't make sense until I give you an example, but a loop's precondition is its postcondition. The thing that's true before is the true is what's true afterwards. Uh, a loop invariant. Okay, that's that's what invariants are for because a loop. Uh, Something that's true will be something, uh, something that's true before will be something that's true afterward, okay? And that's very, very useful for us. So, let's prove that this function computes x to the power of n, all right? So it's power of xn, it's computing that x is to the power of n. Yes, we are still recording, very nice. Let's do this. We have to find an invariant in this loop, something that never changes. So let's think about this. So no matter what the user gives us, we have x and we have n. So j starts out being 0, like right here. j is 0, power equals 1. And let's pretend that like x was, let's pretend that x is 2 and n is 3. So what, what's going to happen in this loop is it's going to use j to keep track of how many times it's done things. It's going to set power equals uh, old power times x, which the first time it's going to make it uh, 2, it's going to go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, right? That's the hope. And then it's going to increment j, j++, essentially. And that means j is going to go from 0 to 1 to 2 to eventually 3, and that's what's going to stop the loop. What's always true about this loop? We have to kind of generalize, and that's the, that's the little trick. What's always true, no matter how many times we execute this body, yeah? And the trick is using j in power, okay? This is the invariant. No matter what, these kind of stay in lockstep. Boop, 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 and boop, yeah? No matter what happens, j, sorry, power <laughs> equals x to the j. Do you see that? Because at the very beginning, before the loop ever starts, x to the 0 is equal to 1. And then, after one iteration of this loop, let's pretend, assume this, we'll make sure that it's still true, okay? So let's uh, assume that it's working right now, assume that this is, is true, we're going to run this body, okay? So whatever it was, it was this before, okay? power equals power times x. So now power equals x to the j plus 1. And uh, j is now j plus 1. So still, x is to the power of j. You see that? No matter how many times you execute the body. And so if it was true before, it'll be true afterwards, because no matter how many times we execute the body, this statement will be true. So we know down here because of the loop invariant, we know this is correct. Because it's kind of like an inductive proof. We assume that the loop invariant holds before. We execute the body once and make sure it still holds afterward. And if that's true, no matter how many times the body executes, it's going to work out. OK? That is my little hand wavy proof of using this for program verification. It's very fun to think about. Uh, and then finally, uh, before we go, I would like to show you some recursive definitions examples, OK? So just like way the heck up here, we talked about uh, using like pseudo induction to define like the natural numbers. Like how in the world was the natural numbers defined? And I cannot remember where we did it, and I'm sorry about that. Oh yeah, here it is. It's like, OK. Yeah, pseudo base case, say something in the set. In the set, pseudo inductive step, say that okay, if you have something in the set, then you have one more other thing that's also in the set. You just add things in that way. So that's essentially what a recursive definition is. Let's define a set using some base cases and then some uh, rules that are not inductive, but we say recursive instead. Okay, we'll see that there is a very very uh, huge similarity about inductive things and recursive things, OK? That's the hope. So uh, let's define this set BAL of balanced parentheses. So 
that's a balanced parentheses because they're all closed and nice. That's balanced because they're all closed and nice. And this one's also balanced because nobody is ever missing anything. Like this wouldn't be balanced, but this is still balanced. It's fine. Okay. So you can define this set by building it up. You can say, okay, uh, at the very beginning, the basis step, the empty string is in the balance set because there are no parentheses. Yeah. All, all zero parentheses, they're balanced. Yeah. And then you have a bunch of rules that say, okay, if you have something in your set, you can use that thing to make new things in the set. Okay. So if this thing is that is in the balance set, put some parentheses around it and put it back in the balance set. So this is, uh, this is saying that you can add this lambda that, which is equal to this and that, because this is the, the empty string. So that means this is also balanced. Okay. That's how we can go from here to here. And okay, if we have two things in balanced, we can also put, let me use the same thing twice. Then you can put it twice in balanced. Okay. And this is how you can build up things. You can use these rules based on things that you have in there previously. So let's take this one and use the first recursive rule to say that I can wrap parentheses around this. You see that? And this, uh, it just so happens will turn out to build everybody, every single, uh, balance parenthesis string. It'll work. Yeah. So, uh, that's my final example for you. Let's make our own recursive definition to build up some cool looking strings. All right. So let's make a subset of binary strings. So they're just strings that look like this with, uh, zeros and ones, just a bunch of zeros and ones. And this set is going to have all the strings that have the same number of zeros and ones. So they got to have like zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 things like that. That's our set. Okay. It's going to look like that. Uh, and so let's, let's get started. So definitely the empty set is in here because it has, or sorry, the empty string is in here because it has zero zeros and zero ones, same number. Yeah. So we'll call that the basis step. Lambda is totally an S and then we have our recursive rules. Okay. Recursive rules. And I encourage you to think about this, but, uh, the idea is take something out of S and then, uh, you're going to have to put something with the same number of zeros and ones in it. Okay. So like if X is in S, well then add, you can add uh, 0x1, you can add 1x0, as long as you're keeping the same number each time. Okay. So that's saying, okay, you can go from lambda to 0, 1. You can go from lambda to 1, 0. You can go from 1, 0 to, by this rule, 0, 1, 0, 0. <laughs> yeah? Oh, shoot. 0, 1, 0, 1. That's what it should have been. Excuse me. So that works. That is a nice way to do things. And honestly, I can't convince myself that that is not enough. Actually, yeah, it's not enough because, uh, sometimes you just want to have, I think, uh, backwards. I think you're not allowed to do it with just these rules. So there's one more rule that I think you also need. If X and Y are in S, then add, uh, x, y to s. And this should work because you can add like two things and they're still going to have the same number. Oh, shoot. Why was I? These two things that I wrote here. Sorry if you were yelling at me. These shouldn't be there. They had the, uh, they had different numbers of zeros and ones. I'm so sorry. So like we could take these two and add them together and they'll still have the same number of zeros and ones. So it would be like zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one. So they all have four zeros and four ones now. Okay. So this is why that works. And, uh, I think that's all I want. That's all I wanted to say to you. So let's make sure I'm recording. Uh, yes. So that is my last example. That's recursive definitions. And we're going to come back and talk about recursive algorithms and prove that those are correct in the next lecture. All right. So I'll see you then.